Good morning. Welcome to Northmont. Thank you for being here this morning. As we begin and before our announcements, please feel free to stand and meet and greet with one another. Hey, that was pretty good. You did all, you kind of recognized what we were doing and you sat down. That was great. So just really just a couple of things uh, for you to know this week. Uh, the first thing is that we continue with our Amos program here this Wednesday. Uh, and so just a reminder uh, for children, it starts at 5 p.m. Uh, and there's Bible study for adults at that time uh, with me. And then there's dinner at 6 and then at 7 o'clock, uh, there is the same Bible study that I did at 5. And so if you were so riveted at 5 that you thought, I have to come back and see what he does at 7, even though it's the same passage, you can. Um, but then um, the youth will go off at 7, and uh, you will stay with me, and then we are all done at 8 o'clock. So uh, please know that that Amos program continues this week. Uh, but this will be the last of this chunk. Um, so we're doing the gospel according to Winnie the Pooh. And so we will uh, conclude that this week. And then we'll have a little bit of a break in October. And then we'll begin again in November. And so uh, just be paying attention to all of those uh, things as we go. And we'll make sure that we keep you aware of those things. Uh, the second is that after uh, worship uh, this morning, there will, be not, there will not be a fellowship time. I know, I know, I'm disappointed too. But we're going to make it up to you, so much so that we're going to have a special worship service and then an even better fellowship time after that. So at 2 p.m., you get to be a part of the ordination of Stephanie Martin right here in this place. You'll get to meet new people. You'll get to see new things. It'll be fantastic. And I, I can't, if we have shrimp on a normal fellowship time, I can't even imagine what will happen at this one. 
So please return for that service. We are celebrating with the Presbytery. We are celebrating um, with uh, those other churches and places that, have, uh, that join us in ministry. Uh, there'll be lots of different people here. So again, 2 p.m. for the service. Uh, I'll be involved and other people here in the congregation along with uh, other folks in the Presbytery. So we invite you back uh, to celebrate this new chapter in Northmont's um, life uh, as we invite uh, Stephanie into ordination and uh, as an associate pastor here at Northmont. So, 2 p.m. Anything else from anybody else? Because sometimes I get that look like you were supposed to and you didn't. Anything from back here? Anything from you? You? I don't want to hear it later. I don't want to hear it. Okay. And scene. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. We approach God with the spirit of hopefulness. We approach the Holy with the spirit of gratefulness. God abides with us, claiming us as children. We affirm the presence of God and are thankful for the sanctuary the Lord provides. Come, let us worship God.
may be seated. If we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins before God and our neighbor. There are times when my faith is not strong, when I deny the love and grace of God. There are times I refuse to trust, refuse to intervene, and refuse to speak. But worse yet, I stand on the shore, judging those that do the same. I shake my head as others struggle or turn a blind eye to their pain. Grant me grace, O oh God. Fill my heart with gratitude. This I ask in Christ's name. Amen. God's grace is boundless. God's mercy is limitless. God's love is timeless. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. All right, if I can have those who are young or young at heart up here, please, that'd be swell. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. So, my friends, how you doing? All right. So, we, go ahead. So, we've had a week of Eeyore. We've had a week of Pooh Bear. And now we move... The most Tigger tastic of all, Tigger himself. Now, Tigger is famous for lots of things. He's got his own, his own kind of thing going on, right? He's unique in the Hundred Acre Woods. No one like him. And he tells us this as often as he can. And when I think about Tigger, I think about the, the idea of him being the only one. Because sometimes we think about, I wish there were people in my life that I could clone. If I could have 10 Jennies, I'd take 10 Jennies. I don't know what I would do with 10 Bob Kalers. <laughs> I'm thankful for you, Bob. All right, so, because he's the only one, for sure. But there, there are times in our lives when we are amazed by the fact, at least I am, that we get noticed at all. Because we tend to kind of feel like sometimes that we blend in. Yes, we are thankful that our parents know us and that our family knows us and that sort of thing. But it is sometimes hard for us to ever understand or to ever feel like we are unique or special because there just seems to be a lot of us around. But what I'm reminded of in this story, and I think what we'll hear a lot about this morning, is that Tigger reminds us of something special. That the world isn't always going to recognize who we are, but we get to show 
other people what makes us unique. You know, I, I think often about the fact that as hard as life can be and as much as I can struggle with who I am and what I'm supposed to do and you ever feel that way? Like, what am I supposed to do on a daily basis? I don't always think of Tigger. I can't say that I do. And I can't do that laugh he does, so I'm not even going to try it. But what I am reminded of is that there is something inside of me that no one else has. And that's what I see in him, and that's what I think I see in all of the people around me who I get to know. But sometimes we have to look for it in other people, just like I know what Sally makes Sally, Sally, her own Sallyness, and Penny, her own penniness, and me, my own Benniness, right? It's something inside us that I didn't create, but something inside us that, that God reminds me is there. And sometimes it takes other people, which is why we have a church. And sometimes it just takes me giving myself a moment to block everything else out and remember who I am. I think that's what's special about church, that it allows me to remember who I am because someone tells me, and it gives me the space to do that for myself. You're not always going to get it right. People aren't going to always pat you on the head and give you a lollipop and tell you how special you are. But that doesn't mean that you're not that doesn't mean that Bob isn't. Look how special he is. Or that Jenny is. Or any of these other folks are. But that's what I think is wonderful about church. That we get to be just with God. But then we also get to just listen and be reminded by the people around us. In this little hundred acre wood. How magnificent and fantastic we were made to be. So I'm going to pray for all of us and our own tiggerness and salliness and penniness, and then we'll go from there. You, you all right? All right, here we go. God, we thank you this morning that not only have you made all of us unique, but that we can be reminded by you, and by, be reminded by all of our friends and family around us how much we are loved. And how much what we bring may be different than what every else, everyone else brings, but is valued and loved. We don't have to be like our neighbor. We don't have to be like that person next to us or in front of us. We don't have to be able to sing well or to speak well. We just have to be ourselves. So I thank you for them. I thank you that you're here. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for being here and being present with us this morning. We thank you for these ancient words that are ever new. We ask that you open our hearts and open our ears to hear what you would say to us this morning through these words. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Our first reading for this morning is found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. You can find this on page 163 of your pew Bible if you would like to follow along. Listen now for the word of God. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and ordinances that the Lord your God has charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and to occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord and your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now continue in Jeremiah. This in chapter 32 can be found on page 736 of the Old Testament. Hear now God's word. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah had conf was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. And now moving to verse 6. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed and sealed it. I got witnesses and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions in the open copy, and gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Nerai, son of Mansia, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of guard. In their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. 
My friends, these two are God's words for us this morning. Great stories, regardless of their origin, require great storytelling. Because as you know, in great storytelling, there's a certain ebb and flow and a cadence to them. Fictional stories require that the one telling that story must create the world around those characters. You have to be able to imagine what they look like and what they feel like. Imagine trying to read anything from the Chronicles of Narnia. Some of you are, are, are aware of that series written by C.S. Lewis. And if you can't get your mind around what it would look like to walk through that wardrobe and brush your fingers against the furs in that wardrobe and then come out the other side to a, a snowy little road that goes out to a lamppost, then you don't get the world that they're entering into. The storyteller has to be able to pull you in and make you care about those characters in that world. Because once I'm in it, it can't just be a series of events. It can't just be things that happened. This happened to him, and then this happened to her, and then this person goes, this person stays. I have to care about who wins and who loses. I have to care about who lives and dies. It's like watching these television shows that we all get wrapped up into at home. Because it's just a bunch of gangsters, or it's just a bunch of fantasy characters, or it's just a bunch of whoever, unless you make me care about that person. I have to care that they're gone. It changes the show. It changes the whole essence of what we're doing. This person came in and made everything feel different. The world that you live in in that show has to surround you or you turn the channel. And the same can be said for good storytelling. And if the teller of the story falls short of that task, then it doesn't matter how creative the ideas are. It doesn't, how, doesn't matter how imaginative or futuristic or otherworldly or detailed all of that is. If I don't make you care about it, then it's just words on a page. It doesn't really matter. Because if I can't hear and feel all of that, then it never really becomes real. And I think the same can be said about the stories that we tell of historical significance. Not the ones that we create out of thin air, but the ones that happened in the past. The ones that history teachers and geography teachers and all other educators are trying to make alive for you in the here and now. We can hear about the Civil War, but if we can't smell gunpowder whenever we do so, then it doesn't really have the same effect. If we can't imagine the tension and the pain and the hurt of a civil rights movement, that's just something that happened back then. Because what I realized here recently is that the events of 9-11 I won't ever forget. I will know, I know exactly where I was actually when Sarah called me on the phone that morning. Turn on the TV, Ben. But for some people in this room, that's a history book lesson. That didn't happen in your lifetime. So if I can't make it real for you, then it's just something that happened. It's just numbers. It's just a date and a pain in the butt whenever you get to the airport. Because if I don't make it real for you, then it stays in the past. It dies with the people who were living it, and it doesn't go any further than that. We forget the past because no one really bothered to show us how to hold on to it. And of course, we also forget the past when we ignore our history, because then when we ignore our history, we are doomed to repeat it. We get a little bit of freedom, and then we oppress someone else. So the storyteller is an important part of how we understand who we are and how we understand the world around us, whether that is a real place or an imagined one. The storyteller is as important in the Hundred Acre Woods as he or she is on the plains of Israel. That storyteller has just as much significance 
in worlds of fantasy as in the real ones that we know exist, even if they are thousands of miles away. That person has a responsibility to connect us. I have to connect you to those people in that story. And I have to find a way for them to connect to you, not just you to them. They have to be significant in your life. I need to see a little bit of me in them and them a little bit of them in me or I lose it. I need to be able to see evidence of how that story might shape who I am and where I'm headed, the decisions that I make. This story about Jeremiah buying a field should never, if you read it again and again, it should never have reached our ears 2,600 years later. Somehow this story has survived that long. And out of context, which basically is what you heard this morning, it sounds more like something that is kind of a minor accounting detail. Like we found it in some pot somewhere. Well, it, it's, I think it's in Hebrew, so maybe we should just save it. I don't know what it means. I don't know why they're talking about it. But it's probably important. It's old. They're ancient words. So let's hold on to them. How could a story about money and contracts between people with names that I clearly could barely pronounce be interesting to anyone at all? But as I said, it's how you tell the story that counts. You have to set the scene. You have to make me care. You have to put me in that. You have to breathe life into it. Breathing life into it. It's the passion of poets, and it's the profession of pastors. To speak about Jeremiah's field is to come to the painful and inevitable crumbling point for the people who were promised this land. All that was meant to be, all that they had been given was about to be lost. What Moses began all those years ago would lead them to Babylon. And the king, as kings are prone to do, did not want to hear it from Jeremiah. He didn't want to hear this word that you are about to go down, because that's exactly how he ended himself basically in prison in those courts. Jeremiah said to the king, my friend, everything is about to crumble and it's going to crumble on your watch. The king, not surprisingly, was not terribly excited about this news. And so he said, prophet, go away. And so he locks Jeremiah up. Locks this prophet away because the truth that he spoke was too hard for him to hear. And as history has shown us, prophets willing to speak truth in pivotal moments are often shot down or shot in hotel rooms or shot in convertibles. And so if Jeremiah's voice could not be heard, then he would have to put his money where his mouth would have otherwise been. So that means that on its face, buying this field when everything was about to crumble and all the people were about to be stripped from their land and taken off to a foreign place, presumably never to come back again, to be made basically the same types of slaves that they were made in Egypt, to buy a field at that moment was absurd. It would be like reserving a room on the Titanic for its return voyage as the band played on. But this story is not about real estate, it's about redemption. That the story was not going to end right there and right now, but that it would continue because God promised that it would. And nothing that King Zedekiah did or didn't do would disrupt God's plan. And I love the way that Jeremiah does this in this story. Because it doesn't really speak anything to how powerful or awesome he was. He didn't part any sea. There was no plague or smoke or fire. Not with sacrifice or lightning or earthquake or trembling. But God would show up in his silence. And a pen and a piece of paper. 
Sounds very Presbyterian if I think about it. He formed a committee. He got something done. In this simple contract, God's covenant was sealed. And it was sealed to remind us that we would never be alone. And with these simple and intentional gestures, hope would be what marked the end of a chapter in Israel's history. And with hope, we come with three powerful words for this story. Words that leave us in suspense because we know something was about to happen next. But especially when just this story is about to get good, we are given this coven of promise and we have to wait for where it goes to be continued. You don't have to wait very long. Ben and I decided to try something new and split the sermon today, and I get the fun part where we get to talk about Tigger. So I watched a lot of Winnie the Pooh growing up. I mostly watched the short VHS tapes that had a cute little story and a wholesome ending. And as I imagine many of you did when you watched movies, Sometimes you tried to figure out which characters you wanted to relate to, and you also figured out which characters you didn't want to be like. So while I was watching Winnie the Pooh as a kid, I didn't really want to be like Rabbit, because Rabbit was mean when people walked through his garden. I didn't really want to be Piglet either, because Piglet was afraid of everything. I didn't want to be Kanga, because she was overprotective. I didn't want to be Roo, because he was reckless. Owl was kind of a know-it-all, and Pooh was a little bit aloof about everything. Eeyore was kind of a party pooper. But Tigger, Tigger was the character that I always wanted to be like. First off, he's the only character with a theme song. So he bounces into a room and announces his presence. He sings a song about how Tiggers are wonderful and their tops are made out of rubber, their bottoms are made out of springs. Tiggers are fun, and he is the only one. Tigger was bold and confident, well-intentioned, well-loved, and Tigger was certain about who he is. And little did I know at the time that Christians are actually a lot like Tigger. God has placed a unique claim on God's people. God made promises to Abraham about his numerous descendants and a promised land. God called the people out of Egypt. Moses marched those people to the land that was promised to them. God's people dwelt in that land for over 600 years. This promised land and the law are what made the people who they were. They defined themselves by the unique claim God had placed on them. These are God's people. But then, as Ben said, they're exiled from that land that had defined them. They're forced into a foreign land, and that part of themselves that they define themselves by is ripped away from them. So when we lose that thing that we define ourselves by, what are we left with? I think we often define ourselves by things that we do or things that are not permanent. For example, if you met me seven or eight years ago and asked me who I was, I would have told you I was a college senior, or a case manager, or a resident of Virginia. And yet none of those things are true today. Some of you might define yourselves by your chosen career, or your marital status, or many of you by your sports affiliations. But when we define ourselves by those things, when we construct our sense of self based on where we live or how we spend our time, what then happens when those things are taken away from us? Ben talked about how God's people are being forced to leave the promised land, the land that defined them for so many years. And now they dwell in a strange land for an unknown amount of time. So what sense of self remains for God's people? Their unique sense of self was based on this land and based on the law, but it was also based on God's unique claim on their lives. God called these people children and beloved. They knew that God had chosen them and promised them a future. So even when things around them were crumbling, 
They were torn from their homes and their belongings, their sense of tradition and routine. Everything that they thought they knew and depended on was taken away from them, but they remembered that they were claimed by the God of the universe. And when everything around them was changing, their sense of self was still grounded in God's claim on their lives, and that claim did not falter. If only we had that same boldness and confidence to be so sturdy in our sense of self today. So we know that Tigger isn't perfect, but Tigger knows who Tigger is. In all of the movies and books, Tigger often does more harm than good when he's trying to be helpful. But he is willing to jump right in to help others without thinking about the harm that could come to himself. At one point, Tigger says to Pooh, it's a dangerous path I bounce, but I bounce it alone because the Hundred Acre Wood needs a hero, Pooh Bear, and I'm the only one. See, Tigger knows that he is unique and that unique identity places a unique call on his life because only Tigger can be a Tigger. He sees himself as the only hero of the Hundred Acre Wood because he, after all, is the only one. And that meant that he was a one-man crusade. He had amazing friends that we've talked about over the last couple weeks, but none of them truly understood what it meant to be Tigger. So if what I'm saying about God's call on our lives is true, and that we all share this claim on our lives, then that means that I'm a Tigger, but each of you is a Tigger too. And that means the blessing here is that I am not alone and you are not alone. God claimed me as a child of God, but God also claimed each of you. And we are invited to live into this wondrous and mysterious calling on our lives in community with those around us. When we recognize and embrace this calling on our lives, then we let that identity as God's children define us. So who God made us to be does not change when our circumstances change. Our sense of who we are as God's children doesn't falter when the world around us crumbles, when we lose our jobs, when we get dumped, when our friends gossip about us, when our spouse leaves us, when we don't get into our dream college, or when we have big questions with no easy answers, we are claimed by God. Our whole world might fall apart, but our God does not. So not only do we live into this strange calling with each other, but we do it with Jesus, who is God in the flesh. Jesus walked this earth and experienced the range of human emotions. He dealt with temptation and doubt and sorrow and loss. Jesus gets what it's like to be a human. And through Jesus, God has promised and demonstrated that we are not in this alone. So my encouragement for you this morning is simple. Be like Tigger. Be bold and confident. Remember that you're not perfect, but have a grounded sense of self in what you do know about who you are. You are claimed by God as God's child and that unique claim is more than enough. And more than anything, know that you are not flying solo. Whether in the promised land or in exile, you are not alone. To God be the glory. Amen. Please rise as you are able and join me in the affirmation of faith printed in the bulletin this morning taken from a brief statement of faith. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or death 
can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please be seated. And I would ask all of you, as we cling to that rock and keep on singing, that if there are anything in your heart or on your minds this morning that you would like to share one with another. I'm sorry? For Martha, thank you. Yes, sir. For Ted and his back, yes. I, I did get word from Ted that he's still kind of in waiting mode to see what is next, and so he's dealing. Ted Mills has a bad back to a point where he's looking for surgeons and relief, and uh, it's an injury that's sort of um, real, real its uncle head again. And so uh, just in prayers for Ted, he's doing the best he can with this pain, but um, it's... It's been almost debilitating right now, so just prayers for him. 
for Steph and all that is next. And for us. <laughs> I meant that to be serious at first, that it, you know. Anything else? Well, let's go before God in prayer. God of hope and prophets and truth and peace and everything in between. We go to you in times of joy. We go to you in times of sorrow. Whether you are leading us towards the promised land or holding our hands as we are taken into dark places. We ask for your eyes to see and ears to hear. We ask for patience. And we are thankful for love. For all those in need of healing this morning, we ask for your grace. For all the ways that we are looking forward to what is next, we ask that you would continue to guide our steps in wisdom. Allow us to live as your people, to remember who you have made us to be, and to live that out each and every day. But we know that we can accomplish these things not because solely who you have made us to be, because of the Son who redeems us and who gives us an example of how to live in love. So we pray now the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now if the ushers will please come forward, we'll receive this morning's offer.
When we stand, O oh God, let us stand for something. When we walk, O oh God, let us let our steps be steps of praise and prayer. May we walk with purpose. May all you give us, all of your resources and time and talents, may all that fuel us, that wherever we go, and however we perceive that you are calling us to be your church, allow that to fuel us and see the world through your eyes, to love people as you would love them. Let us see the world anew. We thank you for all that we have. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
My friends, before I give the benediction, please know that our Stephen Minister Gene Ewers will be here for you if you are needing prayer or someone to listen to or our shoulder to lead on. Prophets come in many forms and shapes and sizes. Some are there in courts waiting to be heard and doing all that they can to give a message of not only hope but of redemption. And some are there with tails made of springs trying to show us what joy can look like. Prophets are there in the night of the, uh, the dark night of the soul, and they are there when we are in need of someone to lift us up, to spring into our lives, both literally and figuratively, and everything else in between. The ones who come into our lives to remind us who we were made to be. So whether we are being led into something that feels hard, if the next steps that you will take out of this service lead you to something that is difficult, a decision to make, a place to go, a person to visit, or if they lead you finally back into the arms of your families or to a, fa- uh, a friend you haven't seen in a long time, and anything else that it is that we try to endeavor to do as people of faith, what we're reminded of this morning is that we do none of these things by ourselves. We are lifted up and cared for by someone who will not forget us, who plants for us in fields that we cannot imagine, a hope that is there even when we cannot see it and we don't know how we'll get back. And we do not do these things alone because we know that God has not made us for these things. We are made to be in communion with the one who creates us and redeems us and sustains us in darkness and in joy for all time and forevermore. Amen.